We're going to do a, a, something a little different today. Uh, we have our uh, kind of a talk show host, uh, Ellen, I mean, Pastor Susie here, right? Um, she's going to be preaching slash teaching, and we're all going to be just contributing to this message today. And so I hope you guys feel uh, comfortable and uh, ready for today's message. So I'm going to hand it off to Pastor Susie. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. You get a car, and you get a car. Oh. I feel like um, I, should, I should ask them about their personal lives. But um, so today what we're going to be doing uh, is a little bit different instead of actual preaching that I'm going to imagine that we're all kind of sitting around this living room and I'm going to ask um, everybody to kind of walk along with us with your Bibles as well. So just a few weeks ago, I, so I, I can't take full credit for this, so I need to be very honest. Um, I heard... Uh, Dr. Stephen Chang, I didn't actually hear him preach about it, but I heard that he preached about it uh, regarding this COVID situation. And he preached from John chapter 4, the passage where it talks about what it means to actually worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And it is such a timely word. And so I felt like it would be great for us as a community to journey through that as well. So wherever you are at home, I encourage you to open up your Bibles to John chapter 4. We'll be going from uh, the ESV version today. And so we're just slowly going to read through from uh, verse 1 all the way to chap uh, to, not chapter, to verse 26. So I'm going to give you just a second to find it in your Bibles. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. All right, and it reads, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. In other words, it was noontime. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know 
the, that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Amen. So that's where we'll stop for today. This is a pretty lengthy passage. And so before we actually start discussing it, I wanted to give us uh, just a few things to think about, a few filters, if you will, for us to look through this passage. The first thing is that there is such an importance in who it is and where this conversation is happening. The fact that Jesus would go out and seek this woman, I love how it almost sounds like coincidental, like, ah, uh, it was kind of on the way, and he just happened to be at that well, and she happened to be the only one to come out. But in truth, it is a very intentional and very divine way in which Jesus sought out this one woman. Now, the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about her, but the things that he does, uh, the Bible does describe her as is, number one, she was a Samaritan. Number two, she was a woman. And number three, she lived a very particular kind of lifestyle. So the fact that Jesus was actually talking to this woman was outrageous in three ways. Number one, he was a Jew speaking to a Samaritan. They did not associate with one another. They looked down on Samaritans. Uh, in the Gospels, we see this other story of the Good Samaritan. And the reason why that parable was so scandalous is that a Jew would hate to think that he would need help and pity and mercy from somebody that they looked down on. And so they had a long-running history of uh, animosity and looking down on Samaritans. And the fact that this Jew was speaking to a Samaritan was outrageous already. Number two, he was a man teaching a woman. Now, back in, right now, it's okay for us to think about it. We don't think twice about it. But back then, a woman shouldn't have to be taught theology. A, wouldn't ha a woman wouldn't have, to, uh, wouldn't have a place to be taught by a Jewish rabbi. And this is what Jesus, this is another line that he seems to cross very intentionally. And number three is, it was a sinless person. So Jesus was a sinless person speaking and seeking out a sinner. And it is very clear you know, that this was a woman who went out to the well at noontime, when it is the hottest, when it's the least likely that she will meet people, she'll run into someone else. Um, and it's very likely that she was living in shame, that she, w she was like, have you ever wanted to go out, you know, to the grocery store and you're dressed like a bum? And you will likely not go when most people are there. You're going to try to go for an hour, especially, you know, I live next to Home Plus, and they close at, like, at uh, midnight. And so when I'm dressed like a bum, I will go grocery shopping, like, around 11, 11.30 p.m., so that I don't really run into anybody I know. So in the same way, that's kind of a silly uh, way to look at it. But this woman that was getting water at noon, the hottest time of the day, was likely trying to avoid people. And this was somebody who didn't live with her head held up high, like, I have nothing to hide. But this was somebody who was probably living in shame and so it's so important that in the midst of all the reasons why Jesus should not have associated with her he says very clearly through his actions I see you someone who's probably neglected overlooked in society and he says I see you not just the woman right now but I even see what kind of life you've been leading I know that uh, you've been chasing after perhaps satisfaction or hope um, or security in all these different ways. And I see you. I see even beyond the person that I see right now. Um, I, I wanted to also highlight this. And as I read it, and as I read this passage over and over again, what Jesus seemed to be asking this woman in a very roundabout way, um, you know, when she says, like, this water that you're talking about, it sounds pretty cool. Uh, can I have some of it? And Jesus' answer, so bizarre, it is, go get your husband and come back. And that has nothing to do with water. That has nothing to do with anything. And yet Jesus is giving her an opportunity, you know, to kind of, you know, uh, acknowledge where she is at, what kind of life she's lived. And this is maybe me reading a little bit into it. But the question that I hear resounding over and over again through this passage is Jesus asking her, aren't you tired of this? Aren't you tired of this life? You know, aren't you tired 
of having to go back and forth to this well, you know, and every time you get thirsty, you're going to have to come back again. And every time, you know, like it's not going to quench you and you're going to have to come over and over again. Aren't you tired of running after these men? Like it's husband number one and that doesn't seem to satisfy. It's husband number two, number three, number four, number five. And now the person that you're living with is not even your husband. Aren't you tired of this kind of life? Mm -hmm. And the third thing that I feel like he's kind of subtly asking is, aren't you tired of worshiping a God you don't know? Aren't you tired of worshiping God from a distance. You've heard about this God, and you worship God in a different mountain separate from Jerusalem, and you've heard about this God, and you feel like you can, you know, like you'd love to draw close to him, and you don't know what it means to worship, and this is why you're asking this question, Are, am I allowed to worship God in this different mountain? Am I doing the right thing? And it seems like she's one step removed from really touching and coming into contact with a God that she wants to know. And so this over- our, like overarching question of, aren't you tired of this life? Aren't you ready for something different? Don't you want something more? Is kind of what seems to be uh, hinted at all throughout this passage. And now the really cool thing about it as well is that he doesn't just kind of like provoke this dissatisfaction and then he's like, all right, that was a great conversation, got to go. But he actually gives her a promise and gives her inroads into what she's actually looking for. And that is uh, a time will come when worshipers will actually worship God in spirit and truth. And the coolest part about it is I, I never really stop long enough to catch this part. Um, and I don't know the exact, yes. Um, in verse 23, it says, but the hour is coming and now, and it is now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And the reason for it is, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. It's not that, hey, you're going to find the way sooner or later, just keep searching. It's like God is looking for you. God is searching you out wherever you are, whatever kind of life you've lived, whatever kind of satisfaction you've looked for in all these different idols, God is looking for, searching you, seeking you out. And he will see to it that worshipers will come to a place where they can worship in spirit and in truth. And that is like... It's good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is such a relief because when we approach this and we put ourselves in the shoes of the Samaritan, we're like, oh, shoot, he knows all my sins. He knows everything I've done. I better, you know, whip into shape and, you know, get my act together. And maybe then I will be able to worship in spirit and truth. But what Jesus promises here is he looks at the Samaritan woman who is overlooked, uh, who is probably avoided, who's shamed, who's ostracized. He looks at her in the eye. He sees her entirety. He sees her entire life, even the things that she wants to hide. And he says, I still see you, and God is seeking you out. God sees that heart of, that longs to worship him, and he's going to see to it that you worship him in spirit and in truth. And so that's kind of all that I wanted to say about this passage in order for us to kind of see this passage and read this passage in a very different light. Hopefully, it begins to resonate with us, the power of the gospel, of Jesus reaching out to us with this message of hope, of wherever you are, wherever you find yourself to be, whatever failures you see so clearly right now in your life, there is hope because the Father is seeking you out. And there is something greater and much better than the life that you are experiencing right now. It is not, you know, this like, let me help you improve your life, you know. It's not just a fixer up, you know. It's, it's not just that. But it is Jesus saying, trade in this life that, that doesn't satisfy you. And you know this. Trade in this life and let me give you something much better. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I wanted to open it up now to pastors, you know, uh, David and JP, uh, and ask them, you know, all these questions that Jesus seems to be asking. Maybe a, a first good question would be, what was one moment, if you had to pinpoint a moment, what was one moment where you felt like overlooked? You know, like perhaps nobody sees what I'm going through. Perhaps nobody knows about the life that I have at home or in the secret place, and yet you felt seen 
and acknowledged and validated by God. You want to go first? Me? Okay. Um, I think before answering that question, um, something I noticed that dawned on me as you were sharing was, uh, you know, a lot of times when we read this passage, we take it like individually. You know, am I the Samaritan woman? And uh, Jesus sees me, just as you're saying. But I was thinking as I read this, I was like, wow, actually, the five husbands, it can actually represent, um, like, I'm reminded of the people of God in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. Israelites. And the five husbands can, can represent different gods, mm -hmm. right? Like um, Asherah, mm -hmm. Baal, and all these things. And I feel like it's not just a representation of just one person, but Samaritan woman is a representation of just all of God's people. Right. And I just feel like, I just feel like I wanted to point that out, you know, because I just noticed it as you were just sharing right now. In terms of personally, this passage, John chapter 4, is a very, a passage that's very dear to my heart. Um, when someone says John chapter 4, I automatically know what it is because it, hit, it hits me, it hits home. Um, because if I, if I could share more personally, um, around this time last year, I was going through a lot, and I know if I share everything, it's going to go on forever. Um, there was a time last year when I was visiting home for about a month for like a mini sabbatical, let's say, and I had been, I'd come out of a in very intense time of ministry. Our church was going through crazy transition and all that, and I was asked to go home and rest, and so I left um, work here, and I went home to rest, but I did not know what was coming. Um, for the first time in my life, long story short, I would experience uh, anxiety attacks, I would experience insomnia, and I would just really go into this dark hole. Um, and the reason why that happened, what God was really uh, revealing to me the dependencies in my heart, the things that I would really cling to to shape my identity. And um, what it came down to was it's basically, um, there's, this, there's this quote, I think it's by Voltaire. It talks about how in our hearts there's a, there's a hole. It's a God-shaped vacuum, he says. He talks about how it's like a hole that's, it's not just an empty hole, it's a vacuum. Because we were made uh, to be satisfied. We were made to fill that hole. We were made for that hole to be filled. And I realized that at that time, um, because God had brought me away from the things that tried to fill that hole, and those things were actually, what, my job as a pastor here. It was my relationships. It was my friendships. All the crutches that I had to satisfy this vacuum in my heart. But now that I was taken away from these things, I felt so empty. I felt so alone. I felt so not i felt like my identity was like nothing and my value was placed on what i did as a pastor my work um how my friends saw me how my girlfriend saw me how like how i was perceived and seen as for, by everyone those around me but now that it, that's all gone i'm like i felt so alone i felt so depressed and um it took later on to find out where that was coming from and so for me i could um, the reason why this passage specifically speaks to me is because during that time, um, I was also, even though I was on like sabbatical or rest, I still had to make weekly Bible studies for our church. Um, so I was technically, st I was still working. I was making these Bible studies, and at that time, our church was going through the book of John. And it was John chapter 4 that was landing, you know, we were doing John chapter 4. And honestly, I was like, I am not in the mood to do this. I'm, I'm like, I'm not in the place to do this. I feel like a mess right now. And let's just get this done. Let's come up with some questions. Da, 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 da. I'm in my living room at home. And then I'm like, um, I'm reading this passage, and then I feel like the Holy Spirit just like, like stabs my heart with this passage. And, and I find myself weeping in my living room. Uh, because I'm realizing, like this woman, I'm looking to all these different places to fill this hole, all these different places to satisfy my soul. And I felt like Jesus was like, hey, come back to me. Uh, I see you. Like, let me satisfy you. 
I am the perfect shape to fill that hole in your heart. And so in that moment is when I felt like um, Jesus was like, I see you. Let me satisfy you. I'm drawing you away from these things um, so that they're no longer the temporary things that you're not made for these things ultimately. And so for me, it was at that moment last year, it, was, it began a healing process for me. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's really good. Um, yeah. It's funny because as you were sharing, I think um, what I was thinking was like, oh, I've never ha had that actually kind of moment, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, it's never like a moment where I was like, oh, man, I'm so dependent on these things. Like, I need to, like, it was never like a rock bottom moment. But I think that's the beauty of the grace of God. It's that... Um, for me, he speaks to me in ways that I understand. And I think for me, um, the lens that I grew up in was as a pastor's kid. This is always my story. Every time I give a sermon, it always starts with as a pastor's kid. Um, I think the way that I saw ministry, the way that I saw church life, the way that I saw things, it was like um, very, uh, in one way it was very objective but also very subjective of course but I think the way that God spoke to me is that um, there are moments where I question are these good things in my life becoming uh, those the ultimate thing the one thing right we, we talked about this a few times these past weeks is it becoming the one thing and I think the, this question comes up in my everyday life not just like one moment so I think the grace of God for me is like he reminds me that my wife even though she's a good thing if she becomes the one thing, if she becomes <laughs> my five husbands, or <laughs> if she becomes sure. that thing that I desire more than God, even my son, even though he's a good thing, he's a gift from God, and I love him very much, like, if he becomes my focus and I try to make him that one thing, then it'll overtake me. It'll, at the end of the day, he's going to leave in 20 years or whatever, 18 years, when he turns 18. The day that he turns 18, he's going to walk out the door <laughs> and... When that happens, am I going to be left with nothing mm. because I poured so much into him? Yeah. So these kind of questions, although it's not like there was a moment like uh, Pastor JP shared, I think for me, it's like it happens frequently. And uh, that's God's grace too. I feel like um, maybe if I had that one moment, I would break. I would like go. I mean, I've, ha I've had um, moments where I placed my... Um, identity I placed my uh, value into people uh, in past relationships and stuff and I have reached that rock bottom but by the grace of God I have I would like to call it matured <laughs> um, I've matured to become a person that questions those things frequently and I feel like people um, also can question that in you hey are you spending too much time on this are you putting more, more value in this than you should a time with God. So I think these are things that you should be uh, getting through accountability, through community. Um, and luckily, I have an amazing wife who can call me out on these things. Um, so, yeah, I think instead of just one moment, I think for me it's just a series of moments. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think just to clarify, it was a significant moment for yeah. me. But like... <laughs> There's a different for, bottom. <laughs> like for sure... <laughs> Like every day, you know, it's like I drink from different wells, you know, so to speak. Uh, I preached a message a couple of weeks ago talking about uh, repentance and just creating a picture of just we're always, we're always needing to repent every day because we always stray. We always stray from the living water. Right? We always drink from different wells because of the sin nature in us and we, we turn back. And so like, you know, every day, like God... Because we have, we have so much blessing in our lives, and it's so easy for us. It's so, we're so prone to, you know, make these things, like you said, the ultimate things. And for sure, it's an everyday thing, yeah. But, like, when that goes unchecked for a long period of time, and there's no, like, conviction or whatnot, that's what happened to me last year, where at that moment, it all just crashed down. Like, man, who am I? Oh, man, like, does God, like, really satisfy me like is he really my one thing yeah i would say you've matured since then as well so <laughs> yeah i, don't know. I hope so <laughs> matured matured it's debatable <laughs> it's always yeah yeah and i think similarly for me um 
you know, a lot of what I do um, is probably what I would run to and um, have most pride in. And I feel like God has been very intentional over the, the last years. Like there's very pivotal, like turn around moments for me that I can pinpoint where God would ask me to lay down certain things. So like maybe, I believe it was like maybe like 12 years ago or so, like laying down my family in some way. Um, about 10 years ago, laying down full-time ministry. About three years ago, laying down full-time ministry again. Um, with most recently, with, with, you know, coronavirus and all of this happening, I think, and also you preaching on the one thing, I think that was, it's like such a good moment where Jesus is saying, you know, like, go bring your husband and come to me. Like, bring those idols and bring them before me. Um, so even for me, like in some ways, in a daily way, some ways in like pivotal moments in my life where God has been like, is this becoming an idol? Is this becoming a husband to you? Um, are you drawing from a different well as well? Yeah. Um, kind of along those lines. Um, and this is, I just, I've been thinking about this all morning. Um, I, I'm a bit you know, well acquainted with the Southern Baptist Circle because that's where I, um, I went to Southern Baptist Seminary. And, you know, a day, like yesterday, um, there's this really well-known pastor, actually, that took his own life. Um, and it's one of many pastors that have done that, actually, in the recent while. And there's all these different articles that are, you know, being published by people who were close to him. And he went through a really long journey of realizing that ministry was this idol. And, like, every time this happens, I... I, you hear the same narrative over and over again, the same warning, especially to pastors and to, like, strong Christians. It is like, don't let ministry become your idol. It is not going to save you. It is not going to satisfy you. And it doesn't equate closeness with God. Like, even ministry just cannot do that for you. For sure. Yeah. And so, like, for me, it was, like, a good warning, and it was a good moment to check my heart as well. Like, you know, if all of this was gone, you know, if... If I never got to do ministry ever again, would I still be fully satisfied in God? And will I still feel like I have everything, you know, that I haven't lost anything? Um, and it's such a good heart check, I think, for all of us. Um, whatever idol it is that, you know, you hold and whatever thing you sacrifice for and you work towards and you feel like this is what I was made for, whatever that is. Um, for, for us to bring it before God over and over again to just make sure that it's not an idol. Yeah. And one of the things that you seem, you know, that you mentioned that is super important is having people in our lives that will ask those hard questions and also people that will be safe, you know, to walk that through. It's not just people who like will challenge you and rip you apart and then walk away, but people who will, out of love and concern, they will ask that hard question and be like, hey, don't you feel like, uh, this is becoming too big of a thing in your life. Um, you know, is, is, there, is there something there? And asking that question out of love and concern and then being the, the person to walk alongside with you in a, in a way that doesn't make you feel just exposed and ashamed, but like loved and supported and challenged. And that's like a huge difference. And that's what we're hoping, you know, we'll see in our house churches. And right? I think that um, speaking the truth in love is very important. You have to take a position of humility as a person that's giving um, advice or giving the recommendation or um, yeah but as a person that's receiving that as well I think you have to leave no room for offense either yeah. because you have to be reminded that oh this is someone that I trust this is someone that I can open up to this is someone that I'm doing life with um, is this is there any merit to this and I think it takes humility on both part parties to um, make it so that uh, it'll be fruitful it'll be something that's life-giving yeah, and sometimes we don't start there, you know. <laughs> sometimes the, the moment, you know, the question is asked, like, you're like, oh, what, how dare, don't you know, you know. And you get super defensive, even if that's where you start, you know, in, like, defenses and all of that. You want to be able to land at a place like, well, okay, is there truth in it? Even if it was wrongly packaged, even if it was said, you know, in the wrong way, all of that aside, like, is there truth to it? And then, like, walking that, that path of... Um, yeah, recovery and, and repentance and vulnerability and honesty. Yeah. Cool. I think 
in my life, I've realized that when people confront, you know, when, try, when people try, try to expose idols and dependencies, a lot of times there's like, like a reaction to it. Um, because I feel like usually it's the case when those idols are actually satisfying me mm. in the moment. Mm. And those are the times when we get so defensive. And I get defensive because deep inside I know, because I know that it's true. <laughs> and don't take it away. Like, it's benefiting me right now in my life. Um, I think the time is when I feel the kindness of God and I'm able to repent, I'm able to confess these idols, is actually when, when I realize, it's like God allows me to kind of, allows time to happen and allows me to see, okay, let's see what this idol does for you. Yeah. Let's see what this idol, and we see that in the Old Testament all the time. Like, God is allowing these people to, okay, try it out, yeah. try it out. Try out the king you want. Try out these idols, whatever. And usually at the end of those times when I feel dry, when I feel empty, when I'm left to my end, you know, feeling poor in spirit, right? God's like, okay, now you see. And that's when I get so humbled. And it's like, those are the times when I feel like in God's timing, he sends the right people at the right time. Uh, David's been, you know, David, Susan, you guys have been crucial crucial <laughs> just in my life god has really sent you guys to really um you know point me back to the living water the drink that i should drink from you know we call pastor susie the the one thing pastor <laughs> she has to have psalm 27 for like tattooed on her back yes. one day really big right <laughs> but her lifestyle has really spoken to me a lot of returning back to the well um uh, I do want to mention, as we're talking about idolatry and the things that we cling to, the things that shape our identity and all that, I do want to say that it's not so black and white. Like, I know, like, I'm not a parent, right? You're a parent now. You're a dad now. And to say, like, don't idolize your child, don't idolize Asher, it's really difficult to draw the line. It's really difficult to do that. And... I want to be sensitive and share this because we have a lot of people that even probably tuning in right now that have lost their jobs, that have lost because of the COVID situation. And we're not trying to say, if you feel grief right now, and if you feel like tap tap pe and like heartbroken right now and like stressed out and anxious, then you, you know, work was your idol. Mm -hmm. You know, like we're not trying to come to conclusions like that. like. We're human, and we're supposed to grieve loss in a healthy way. Don't let, I just want to say, don't let religion, like, mm. like get rid of the time that we should naturally grieve for loss. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it was your idol, right? And so, um, but, you know, as time progresses, uh, our hopes should still be in Christ. Our hopes should still be, like, can you, if you want to add to this, just in a, that pastoral voice, of just not making it so black and white of like, oh, it's your idol, you know. Um. Yeah, so uh, like, like what David was saying, it's usually good things, you know. It's good things, and it doesn't mean, all right, then it means leave your wife and leave your child. That's not what it means. It's like a posture of the heart of being, you know, open-handed with the gifts that God gives you and being able to honestly say, even if this were taken away from me, would I be able to worship God? Maybe not immediately, but even if this was taken from me, my health, you know, my job, my family, you know, people I love, whatever it is. So offense, if there's right. offense. Right. I mean, yeah, so you want to, at the end of the day, like know that the gift is from God and you would still worship him whether you had it or not. And it's more of a heart posture. Yeah. yeah. But often, again, we don't start there. It, it takes us a bit to get there, which is... Right, and it's human as well. I like to think of it as like Abraham and his son mm. and his promised son. It was like crazy blessing, but the open hand posture in the heart of like, thank you for this blessing, mm. but like this is my son, but he was willing and he demonstrated that he was willing to lay his son on the altar mm. and God let him keep his son, right? Because he knew his heart and I feel like... Even if he hadn't. Even if he hadn't, yeah. I mean, we don't know, right? But we, we assume that Abraham will, 
He's he'll, getting ready to kill him, though. He'll, he'll de- he, here's what I'm trying to say. If he had to kill him, he'll definitely grieve. And just because he grieved doesn't mean it was his idol. That's what I'm trying to say. You know? yeah. So moving on to you know, the next part of this message, which talks about, so a time will come when worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. Um, what does that what does that mean to us? What is it? Because it's sometimes it's like a phrase that we'll just toss around like a, a Christian cliche. What does it mean to be to worship God in spirit and in truth? But this is, you know, a very literal question to a very specific question that the Samaritan woman is asking. And she's saying, look, uh, we've been told and our ancestors have been told that there's this God that we're kind of far away from and we're kind of a rejected people and we can't go to Jerusalem and, you know, worship this God, but we have this alternate path. We have this other, you know, mountain that we actually get to worship him on. Is that the right thing to do? Um, and then Jesus kind of like says, regardless of that, whether you are in Jerusalem or on this mountain, um, there's going to be a time when regardless of where you are, you know, location-wise and even form-wise, external-wise, there's going to be a time when God, who is spirit, will be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And so I wanted to hear a little bit about what do you guys think about that, maybe starting with our worship pastor. I mean, I think um, this is a very big theme in the Bible. Jesus is just kind of repackaging the theme. Um, in the Old Testament, it was said, like, God... Uh, loves sacrif- uh, God uh, loves obedience and not sacrifice. He desires obedience, not sacrifice. And I feel like it, along the same lines, Jesus is saying, like, it doesn't matter where you worship from. I mean, right now, there's a temple in uh, Jerusalem, and you guys wor- worship on Mount Gerizim. Um, but the time is coming and is now here. He's basically saying, I'm here to tear the veil, to open up the place of worship, to make you the temple. Right? I think God, uh, Jesus in this passage is saying, like, hey, it's not about the physical things. Um, ultimately, it starts in the heart. And it starts where, with the way that you're worshiping in your heart. And I feel like that's the theme of the Bible. When he, when he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. These are all things that we think are like, oh, these are not like external things. These are things that start in here and in here. And uh, so I feel like that's the direction that Jesus is pointing us to in this, in this passage. I like, at first when you read the passage, it's like so random. Like, okay, this woman comes to the well, and then Jesus is like, hey, like, give me something to drink. And then it's just talking about living water and all this. And then all of a sudden, bring your five husbands. Like, there's a random switch right there. And then all of a sudden, it's like talking about worship. Right? And I felt like that was so random. You need, you need to really just park at this chapter and just really read it over and over again to try to get what he's trying to say, Jesus. But um, it's interesting because we're talking about this theme of idolatry of the heart, idolatry, and um, you know, Jesus addresses that with the five husbands. But it goes on to ultimately talk about worship. And I just, yeah, I feel like it's saying that, you know, idolatry and worship are directly linked. And, and in the Old Testament with the people of God turning to different idols and um, it just really represents what they were trying to worship. Um, worshiping in spirit and in truth, um, I think we got to look into Jesus as a Jew. He's talking to a Samaritan and the culture of the people's um, paradigm of what worship was at that time. It was literally a physical building. And at that time, the, mount, the mountain that they were on mount, is called Mount Gerizim, Gerizim, something like that. And it was literally a physical place where people thought they should come to. This is holy ground where we should worship. And I love how David talked about how Jesus straight up tore the veil. And worship is not just a place. In our context, the place where we worship, like at Heart House, right? Um, the worship is not just a certain sound or a certain way in which we think in modern day. It doesn't sound like Bethel music or Hills all the time, you know? Worship, the spirit and the truth, maybe you could break it down. What does it mean to worship spirit? Spirit, you know, what does it mean to, uh, you ask me a question, I'm going to ask a question back. <laughs> Jesus style, right? <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think that's what it means. You can, you, we have access. The key word is access to worship him. But the why is Jesus talking about idolatry is if we cannot worship in spirit and in truth, 
from where we are right now as much as we can when we're all together with the full band and whatnot and everything, that means possibly that, that way has, can possibly be a husband, can possibly be an idol. Um, if I can't worship in this style, but I can only worship in this way, then maybe I have exalted something that should not be exalted. I think that's something that can be highlighted here. Yeah. I think one uh, distinction that I want to make, though, is that I, I definitely agree that there are times where we could worship uh, like, like a, f- a way, a form of something, but I th- also think that we shouldn't um, neglect those things as well. Let's, we shouldn't simplify things because we're trying to get to the spirit and the truth. Uh, I mean, there's a right. song, there's an old song, When the Music Fades, right? That's a really good song, and I love that song. Fire, but, that song's but fire. I think <laughs> we should also be able to worship when it's loud, when it's like, there's a lot of joy, there's a lot of like drum beats and all this stuff. There's so many things that can uh, count as worship. Um, and it's not to say that we want to glorify one or the other, but we want to get to the heart of it. And of course, whatever, if the music is terrible, I can still be able to worship, right? But that's not to say we're going to give out terrible music every week. Um, so, yeah, I think that's one distinction that we should. Again, it's that theme of good things becoming ultimate things, where a good thing, like a, like a style, becomes the ultimate, right? right? Yeah. Mm. And the point that you made is sometimes something that is very quickly juxtaposed, um, like kind of pitted against each other, especially when it comes to like worship style and form and excellence. And it's like either you do it with heart or with the excellence and you can't do both. And that's the way that sometimes it's framed where like if you're doing it with heart, it has to sound terrible. And like it's just really good intentions. And like that's not what, you know, the Bible talks about. It's like people who give him a sacrifice and it's something that costs you something. And that, you know, cannot be used either as you know, an excuse, you know, to be, well, you know, as long as there's, that's fine. Like, no, like you can actually have a heart and excellence and those both things, they um, obviously, they please the Lord. If you had to do without one, probably you would do without excellence, right? But while still saying you don't have to do just with one, like you can actually have both of them. Yeah. Um, And so that makes me very excited even for, you know, this season where we're getting a worship in spirit and in truth practicum right now right like people who are tuning in from home and it is you know you never know until the last minute whether our stream is going to work and you know even today we were having a little bit of drama um and you know like even us as staff until the very last moment we're like okay if this fails and if we are unable to provide the church with a stream is this going to be devastating to their spiritual walk our hope is no you know, our hope is we'll give the best that we have to give. And yet, if this fails, this should not mean that people's spiritual walk will implode. Like, we don't want this to be the other husband, you know? Like, even if it is a secondary, you know, husband, um, we don't want this to be also an idol. And so, even for us today, we were kind of um, tested in that regard, where we're scrambling right before 11 o'clock, and that's why we started, like, maybe five minutes late. And it was, you know, if things kind of, you know, happen and we cannot have a stream on a Sunday, um, will we still believe that God is, you know, the Father is seeking out worshipers in spirit and in truth, and worship is going to happen, whether it is with a stream, whether it is with music or not, uh, when people have the spirit of God living in them. And so that's the final thing that I want us to close with today, this idea that it's not just like, hey, let go of those, you know, this well of Jacob that won't satisfy you ultimately. Um, And it's not just like move over to this other well that is wells of springs of living water, but it's actually, it's going to become a living well overflowing from within you. And so um, it's more than just satisfy yourself in this, in this other source, but it is also that you yourself will have the living spirit of God alive within you and you will become a well to other people. And so you want to add to that? Uh, I love, I love the, we didn't read this portion of scripture, but if you keep reading until verse, uh, yeah, 39 through 45, that the Samaritan woman, she, she, uh, she drinks from the well. Like she, in her heart, she believes in who Jesus is as the Messiah. And what happens is she, she drinks from the well. She, she comes thirsty, right? 
And then she leaves to go into town and begins to share that which satisfies her. So she's looking for a well. She drinks from Jesus, the well. And then, like you said, she becomes the well because she goes to town. She testifies. And she starts saying and talking about Jesus um, because of this radical encounter she has. And I love that, that, um, I love that idea of when we are satisfied in Christ, we become a well. We become, we overflow. Um, actually, in, in a couple chapters later, I'll read it, chapter 7, verse 37. It says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out. And Jesus said this, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And that sounds like overflow to me. Something I talked about with David uh, a couple of days ago is one thing that I'm learning these days that God is really teaching me is we cannot love from a deficit. Like when we try to love from a deficit, it becomes just religious. It becomes empty. And ultimately it becomes lust. It becomes self-serving. But when we love from an overflow, uh, when, we, when we become a well, like, I think a lot of our lives, we either are thirsty and looking everywhere to be satisfied, or if we're really being satisfied in Christ, we're a well going around and releasing life everywhere. Um, so that's, that's what I see in this. Um, I think this is really great, and I want to ask, I want to ask you, Pastor Susie, actually, <laughs> the ultimate question here is... How do you drink from Christ? Like, how do you become satisfied in Him? Of course, every day we come to Him because every day we drink from different source, sources, right? Before before yeah. she answers that yeah. question, I kind of want to throw in my two cents as well. I think you brought up a good point about we can't love from a deficit, and I feel like a lot of people when they first come to church, um, there's a there could be a focus on the output the outreach, the evangelism, like we should do this as Christians, we should do this. It becomes obligations. We should love. Yeah, we, we should. should love. Right, right. But I feel like there is a, an order. There's a sunza, right? There's an order to things. And I feel like you must be first drinking from the well. If you're not, there's no fruit, right? I, th I think I love the image that uh, Jesus gives of himself as a vine. If you're not attached to the vine, there will be no fruit. So we have to be first abiding in him. And I feel like there can, there's, um, there's good in focusing on evangelism. There's good on focusing on missions. But I feel like um, as practical as those things can be, unless we're, again, attached to the vine, unless we're drinking from the well, then it's nothing. It means nothing, right? And, I, and Paul goes into this in his letters all the time. Like, if you can do wonders and miraculous signs but have not love, then you're nothing, right? Yeah. So... Um, I, sure. I think it's very important that you brought that up as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yes, going back to the question that you asked, how, how do we drink from the well? We've been preaching on this the past couple of weeks. Um, right. The one thing I desire is right. drinking from the well. Mm -hmm. like, from your experience, I guess, what does it look like? Yeah. In a practical way, so how it looks like for me personally, and it's kind of like how the passage that we just read ends, actually, where it ends with, um, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. It's almost like he's not giving her the luxury of like, okay, it's, it's changing from this strategy now to this strategy. It's like he forces you to deal with him as a person. And for me, I think I would say that that's probably the key. Um, there's many moments in life, and I can you know, go on for weeks on end without treating Jesus as a person. Because I can do the religious thing, I can prepare the sermon, I can, you know, dissect, whatever, you know, I can do all these things without actually dealing with Jesus as I would a person. But then those moments where I feel like there, there's, there are those, like, water, watermark moments where, where Jesus kind of interrupts, and I have to deal with him as a person, I have to speak to him as a person, and even when I sing, you know, even if it's pre-written words, it doesn't matter, like, I need to almost like get into the mental space and realizing that I'm actually talking with a person right now. And so 
like if, if I were to, for example, just this past week, one of the things that I did in, in my house, it was, you know, I turned off the TV, turned off my phone, all of that, you know, turn off music, and I just sat on my couch, you know, and I, you know, closed my eyes, and I just imagined Jesus sitting next to me, and then I just started having a conversation, and honestly, that's what prayer is about, right, and so it's not just like, our Father who art in, you know, like, not like lofty, you know, speech of any sort, but for me, it looked like, hey, Jesus, you know, it's been a while since we had a conversation. Like, I don't know what's going on with this. What do you think about this? Um, is there something, you know, that you're seeing in me? Like, I don't know, you know, and I begin to have a really honest and vulnerable conversation with him. And I know that if I don't do that, and if I don't connect with him in that kind of way, um, it's very easy for me to fall into doing the Christian thing, bypassing Christ as a person completely. Um, maybe a small anecdote. Um, way back in the day, now must be like 15 years ago or something like that. This is before I even, you know, went to full-time ministry. How old are you then? Just joking. Hey. <laughs> Isaac was three years old. <laughs> Isaac was three years old 15 years ago. Anyway, let's not talk about age here. Um, yes. I remember this, there was this moment where I realized that um, everything that I believed about God, I had already been going to church for years, and I, I had been attending church and learning Bible stories and knowing the Bible and learning songs, doing all these things without ever feeling like it was a person that I was talking to. And there was this moment, I was alone in my room, little Susie Park was alone in a room, and I made up my mind. I don't know where I got this thought, but I made up my mind. And I was like, okay, this thing is bogus. You know, this thing is like drinking the Kool-Aid. I don't know what point I bought into all this, but you know what I'm going to do? On the count of three, I'm going to say, God, I don't think you're real. And then I'm going to walk away. Like, I was like, okay, I'm going to do it on the count of three. And it's not going to feel like I'm saying it to anybody because he's not a person. And I was like mustering up my courage and I was pacing around the room and I was like, okay, on the count of three. Okay, one, two, three. And I couldn't, like, I almost couldn't get the words out. And that's when I realized, like, I actually think he's a person. <laughs> you know? it's, like, it's like me looking at David in the eye and being like, David, I don't think you're real. Like, I'm either insane to say that or I actually don't think that you're going to hear me like a person. And so in that moment for me, it was like doing that with God, like turning around and realizing, okay, I think it's just a force and it's just a religious system. And it is something that I grew up with and I go to church because of my parents. And, but I don't really think that there's a person behind this thing. And so it was that moment of reckoning. And, you know, I finally, you know, not on the count of three, but I finally actually did end up saying the words like, God, I don't think you're real. You know, and I just said, I blurted it out. And then this is probably the first time in my life where I felt like I impressed upon my heart the voice of the Holy Spirit. This is before I even believed in the Holy Spirit and before I understood what charismatic, all of that was. And um, I, what I felt like the Holy Spirit saying to me was like, this is why I came down in flesh. Um, and I was like, Okay, so we're cool on that, <laughs> moving on. And then after that, I felt like that was a major turning point in my life because I realized, like, oh, I'm not just speaking to thin air. It's actually a person, and he cares about what I say, and he's, he's affected by what I say. If I didn't believe that he was affected by it, then I would say whatever. But my words matter to him. My worship matters to him, like my honesty, all of that. And I think it was probably that turning point for me wow. where I started you know, thinking like, okay, it's not just an idea, but it's an actual person on the other side. And I'm going to do the best that I can to get to know this man, to get to learn his ways, hear his voice, get acquainted with how he thinks. Like all these different ways in which you would get acquainted with a person. Wow. Um, I think that for me was a major turning point. That's crucial. <laughs> crucial. <laughs> if I, actually, actually, I know that time is going right. If I can share yeah, yeah, yeah. like a... Uh, if I can answer my own question, <laughs> how does Jesus satisfy? It's a, it's a lifelong journey to figure that out. Uh, I think one thing, when I look at the passage, actually, how is this Samaritan woman satisfied? And what sticks out to me in the passage is that we've got to remember who she is. She is a Samaritan woman. 
she is someone that is not, should not associate with Jews at the time. She is, um, at that time, a woman. And that's why the disciples come and like, why are you talking to a woman, right? Um, and so at that, at that time, she, she's realizing, and of course, com, uh, commentators, uh, commentators, yeah, they say that they know she has a history. She's, you know, she's sleeping around, you know? And she knows who she is. And so she shows up at the hottest time of the day because she wants to stay hidden. She wants to stay hidden. She wants to conceal things about herself. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because she is satisfied because she knows and she recognizes her own depravity. She recognizes her own sinfulness. She recognizes her own uh, dirt. And so I realized even last year when I was, when I had that moment or moments where I felt like Christ was satisfying me again. I knew he was satisfying my thirst, my longing of, the longing of my soul. He was satisfying because I was acknowledging and I was face to face with my depravity. I was face, face to face with my idols. I was face to face with how wicked I was. And all that to say, it's the gospel. It's the gospel that satisfies you. Christ satisfies you through the gospel. And I feel like for all of us and everyone who's listening, if we really want to be satisfied and drink from the well, it's really marinating ourselves in the gospel, recognizing who we were and who we are now because of Christ. Um, I feel most satisfied when I'm refreshed by the gospel. Yeah, I'm like, wow, he does satisfy me. He determines my identity. Everything I have hidden in my heart, I can feel safe to reveal to him. He's kind. He's good. Uh, he will love me, and it's, his love will transform me. And so I think, for me, that's satisfaction. Yeah. I think that's important to mention because that's the truth part of right. what he's speaking about. Like, there is a truth that, we need to understand and there's a revelation from God which is Christ himself who came down to earth because he loved us and he gave himself up, up for us so that we might worship him. I think that's the truth that he's talking about here as well because if we want to worship in the right way, we have to know what the right way is, right? So that truth of the gospel, it needs to be in us. It needs to be who we are and I think that's the mark of a, a Christian, right? And as a worshiper of, of God. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So worshiping in spirit and in truth, it's going to drive us to the word. It's going to drive us to the gospel. And it's not just going to be emotion and, um, you know, fluff, but it's going to be getting acquainted with a person that has self-revealed himself through the word of God and becomes real in our life, in our dealings, in, uh, with our, idol, uh, our idols and uh, the things that we journey through um, as followers of God.